Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Carrie, for the introduction. Um, I'm Colleen, and I work with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers on Oil Sands Communication, and I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce Ken Chapman. So, since 2011, Ken has been the Executive Director of the Oil Sands Developers Group, a local organization focused on improving the quality of life in the Wood Buffalo region. In this role, Ken works with public policy designers and decision makers in all orders of government, local stakeholders, a wide range of industry sector representatives, environmentalists, scientists, Aboriginal groups, and community leaders. Before joining uh, the Oil Sands Developers Group, Ken was the driving force behind Cambridge Strategies, a public policy consultancy group he founded in 2000. Ken was recognized as one of Alberta Ventures' 50 most influential people in 2010 and received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal for Community Service. Um, at the end of this month, Ken will be stepping down from OSDG, sadly. Um, he's been a great advocate of the industry, the Wood Buffalo region, and the men and women who live and work in the area. But we look forward to working with him in his new endeavors. So with that, I, uh, please join me in welcoming Ken to the stage. loud for you? Have you got everybody fine? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk to you for not an hour, I'm going to talk to you for almost an hour because I'm a lawyer by trade. <laughs> so if, uh, what I really want to do is I'll, I'll have myself uh, finish and then I'll be open to some comments, comments, suggestions. It's not a dinner presentation so I'm not worried about the buns. Um, but there is cold water you can throw at me, I know that too. Let me, uh, let me give you some purpose and why I'm here. It's because Jeff Penny asked me to be here. And whenever Jeff Penny asked me to do something, I will always do it. Uh, and I'm proud to do it in this instance. The other reason I'm here is that I want to explain something to you about oil sands and the Athabasca oil sands region. And I want to talk to you as a fellow working in the industry now, uh, not always in the industry, but also as a citizen of Alberta and as an owner of this asset. And you, as Albertans are also owners of this great asset. And what's happening with it, and what we're doing with it, and how we're doing it. This, you've all heard about big bucks, big trucks, okay, and, and big barrels of oil. I'm not gonna talk about those kinds of things, because we've been talking about those things a lot in a long time, and there's nothing wrong with that conversation, but there's really a triple bottom line opportunity here that is magnificent. We are touting ourselves as having the third largest reservoir on the planet. Well, the other two that are ahead of us allegedly are Venezuela, and they're a very honest group in terms of how they do their numbers. <laughs> and the other one is Saudi Arabia, who haven't done an assessment of their reserves since 1976. Huh. So the other reality is we can depend on our numbers, and we may be very higher than that. Well, what we've got here is this magnificent opportunity. 1.7 trillion barrels, in the reserves, the technology to get out 10% of it. You're an owner of this, start thinking like an owner. So we've got 170 billion barrels that we can access with current technology. Of that 170 billion barrel, we've been, we've been extracting it for just about 40 years now. In that 40 years, we have taken out less than 5% of the available resource that we can reach with current technology. This is going to be available for a long time. Now, that 5% over 40 years, it's a, it's a good number, but it's a misleading number. I'm like Penn and Teller. I can tell you the trick and the magic is at the same time. You, you just kind of draw a line that it's a vertical, you know, that's got a steady graph. For the longest time, it was a very flat line, but in about the last 10 years, it's taken off. And we're now at a point where we'll be at 3 million barrels, 3, 5, on an ongoing basis plus there's other growth over that. That's the economic side of it. The environmental side of it is even more interesting. Because we've been learning how to do the extraction and trying to figure out where the business was and how the business would work, the environment has been part of the obligations that we have, and people have thought that we haven't paid enough attention to that. And maybe they're right, but I can assure you now, we're definitely paying attention to it and is it enough attention? Of course not, it'll never be enough attention. But are we doing the right things in the right way in the right time? 
more and more, and we're learning more all the time. Let me, uh, let me give you an example. We have, uh, we live in the Boreal Forest as much as we live in the Osage. And we have a group called the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, who is an independent third party who look at sustaining and maintaining the biodiversity in the region in, in plants and animals going forward. With this development that we've got, and it's big, there is still 97% intact biodiversity in the region. And, there, and we'll continue to be that way. We're proud of that. And it'll, it'll continue on biodiversity. The other element is, on long term, is reclamation. So I'll get into that later on. But I also want you to know is that reclamation now is alive and well and accelerating as well. I'm gonna, I'll take my hand away from that, sorry. Uh, it's accelerating as well. You'll see more and more about reclamation. In fact, habitat protection is the number one value Albertans hold when they measure the industry against their values. And they say, when you say responsible, sustainable development, to an Albertan, what value are they going to use to measure that? Number one is habitat protection. Number two is reclamation standards. What are you doing about reclamation? Number three in that is emissions monitoring. Do we know what we're doing in that area? Number four is greenhouse gases, and number five is water. If we could solve those problems, we'd address 86% of the issues that are in Albertans' lives. We also did that same study with CAP a couple of years ago with Canadians. Same value sets, except reclamation was number one in their mind, habitat protection was number two. But they had the same values in, in terms of priorities. The fascinating thing about this was is that Albertans expected more of ourselves than Canadians expected of us. And that shouldn't surprise you because the more you know about a situation, the more and the capacity that you have and the obligation to have, you'll raise your mind on yourself. Right? You've done it as a student, you've done it as a business person, you've done it as a parent. Uh, we've all done it in our lives. The more we know about it, we, it's called progress in many people's minds. It's, it's striving, it's achieving. Albertans expect more. The other side of it is, on the environment, is that we are now doing monitoring on an independent, third-party basis on a fascinating model that is funded by industry, monitored and regulated by government, but now is the collaborative model. And this is, gets me to where the real topic of the speech is, is about collaboration in social economics. <clears throat> the inspiration for this is brand new. Started a year ago, March, uh, by a group called the Oil Sands CEO Council. 17 Oil Sands CEOs got together on this issue and said, we learned something on the environmental collaboration, can we do the same thing on a community basis? Let me give you a little bit of history so I got you some context on why collaboration now. It became very apparent that we were losing not just the public relations war, but we were losing the hearts and minds battle on social license to operate on the environment. And the response to that was to say, how do we do that better? It's recognized across the industry that we live by the standards of the lowest common denominator, by the worst. Nobody notices or pays attention to the best operators. It's the worst operate, the worst incidents that gets all the news, and everybody's to that same standard. So the industry said, at the CEO level, the highest level said, we've got to find ways of collaborating on the environment. The competitive marketplace, which you people are all in, they recognize works really wonderfully well in a whole bunch of areas, but not in everything. And the environment is one of those areas that it, a competitive model doesn't work very well in. So they forced a collaborative model. It took them 15 months to beat the lawyers up, to get to the point where they could actually start sharing all their intellectual property. And not thinking that it was something that was unique to them and a, and a high value market base. They said, we've got to, whenever somebody gets something really good, the rest of us need it so we can all start using it right away and raise that bar on a collaborative model. So they set up COSEA to do that. And that is now working on that collaborative model. And to get, well, I was, a year ago in December, I was introduced to this idea, and I said, wow, this is really cool, but I'm a lawyer, so you gotta prove it to me, right? I was looking for some evidence of it, and 
This was the evidence that really resonated with me. The, the, the CEO of Imperial Oil at that time said in, in a meeting, he said, he said, we have developed this amazing tailings technology that we want to prove to scale now, but our project, Curl, isn't going to be ready for that to be proven at the scale for three or four years yet. And we think it's that good. So we're actually testing our technology on Shell's tailings. We will compete tooth and nail around the rest of the planet on market share and economics, but we will collaborate on environmental issues, and they are. That spirit of collaboration then was taken and said, can we look at the impacts, the socioeconomic impacts on communities uh, as a result of oil sands development and oil sands growth? And I'm here to talk to you in a larger scale, as well as the Athabasca oil sands region, because quite frankly, you all know what happens in the oil sands impacts pretty much all your communities. When we need a plumber, try and get one. When we need a welder, try and get one, right? We also put a lot of money back into your communities and across, but we also take your people out of your communities as well. So we have huge socioeconomic impacts on your communities as well as in the Athabasca oil sands region. What they did is they said, how do we look at what the impacts we have on the region and what can we do about mitigating those, preventing them, and expanding on the good things? We sat together for about eight months, about 17 companies, and we brainstormed. We came up with 27 different aspects where our industry had impacts, social and economic impacts on communities. We distilled them down into buckets and into theme areas the six of them, and then we refine that into four different areas. So what we are doing now is that we are looking at ways to collaborate amongst ourselves as industry players and with regional stakeholders, and, it, and eventually it'll come to the rest of Alberta. It's how do we become more collaborative on socioeconomic impacts in these four areas? Workforce, not just ours, but everybody in the region. Okay? You can't, when we make a decision, it impacts everywhere else. For example, a number of years ago, we did not have enough camp spaces, so we encouraged people not to live in camps, but to live in the community, and we gave them a, a living out allowance. We gave them cash to do that. Well, the instant impact was to raise the rent of Fort McMurray, because there was more cash around, and the, the landlord's not going to be stupid. And so now the, the poor fellow that's running the hardware store has to raise his rents as well, okay, or, and, and people people just trying to recruit there have to pay a higher rent. Cost of living goes up all the way around. We never thought of the consequences of that beyond our own needs. Workforce number one. Second is Aboriginal relations. We have an awful lot of Aboriginal relations in the oil sands from an industry point of view, but it's on the regulatory side. This is on a stakeholder side and capacity building. The spirit around this is outside the regulatory process but more is how do we work to build capacity and opportunity for Aboriginal people in, our, in the region to get more benefit and participate more in the wealth that's being generated as a result of this industry being there. How do we find the relationship? So we're looking at capacity building, more business opportunities, advancing contract opportunities there, building in communities, working with individuals as well, but it was their institutions or communities with, their, with Aboriginal peoples, and their, and their enterprises. That's the sort of thing we're doing there. The third thing is infrastructure. Well, infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges we have, but we narrowed it down at this point to the infrastructure that the industry needs. So we have to collaborate with the municipality, we have to collaborate with the province, sometimes with the federal government, and, and with local people and stakeholders. We need roads, rails, bridges, pipelines, power lines, all those camps, aerodromes, airports, all those kinds of things to, to handle this, to handle this development of this project, these projects. Give you a size of scale. The airport in Fort McMurray, there's a new airport, $250 million being built. It will be open in April. We're going to do an air show in June. And it has 950,000 people, passenger movements in and out of that airport every, every year. Built for 250000 So it's a big holding pen. But we'll have this great new airport. We also will have an international airport. We already have direct flights into Denver coming in June. We're working 
Carter in Chicago and other places. We're going to have customs up there. And we're now just working on a task force about air cargo. So we'll be doing a lot. It'll be a significant initiative around all of that. Now here's the other side of it. Aerodromes. Aerodrome is a private airport. There are almost as many people flying in and flying out of aerodromes on a private basis, about 825 to 850,000 passenger movements a year into the private airports that are attached to, are attached to projects. Shell has, a, has bigger capacity on their airport on their site than Fort McMurray Airport does on the municipal site. They have a longer runway. They can bring a larger plane, and they do. Uh, I think Suncor is the third largest airline in the country right now, maybe the fourth. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the activity that they have, okay? Um, we have people coming in from all over the planet right now on these kinds of things. That's just one thing is air traffic. We need, we're other thing that we're doing uh, around infrastructure, and we've heard of 63, Highway 63, and the problems with that, and the twinning of that, and the 881, and the access. We only have two ways in and out. Uh, with, with, the, with the highway, uh, we have to bring up these great big modules. These are just, I don't know if you know what a module is, but think of a mechanical set on steroids. Okay? They build these great big modules, they bring them up on trucks, and at best they go 60 kilometers an hour, they go 20 kilometers uphill, and there's a lot of them. Okay? There's even more coming. That holds up the roads terrifically. One of our biggest social license challenges in the next two and a half years is how do we deal with modules? Well, we're a pretty imaginative group. When I was on holidays a couple of weeks ago in London, I stopped off and saw the CEO of hybrid air vehicles. And we're starting to look seriously now, can we use hybrid, not lighter than aircraft, they're not, they're not balloons and they're not blimps, they're really part fixed wing, part rotary wing, and part wing uh, to actually do hyper heavy lifting to move these things into the air uh, as opposed to putting everything on the road. But if, if everybody had their way, uh, all the companies have their way when they want their modules up, according to their plans right now, and these plans change all the time. Uh, we would be, at, at the peak, we would be putting 350 modules a, a week for a four week period, for a three week period rather, in the middle of the summer of, of 14. Uh, if you think of those things, and they're, they're, they're 120 feet long, they're 25 feet wide, and they're 30 feet high. Okay, and they travel 20 kilometers, 50 kilometers an hour. You get a little frustrated behind those things, aren't you? Okay, and if you're not, and everybody would be. So that's one of our challenges. But it's that's again an, an infrastructure area. One of the challenges that we have is the is the tragedy of the commons. And part of the reason to collaborate on social economic is everybody makes their own individual decision in their own best interests against what they're against the, the availability of resources like roadway, we can cause real damage. So we're starting, we're doing better and better and more and more of talking to each other and doing these things on a collaborative, planful basis. The last area is community well-being. And that is the infrastructure needed in the community. That's schools, that's hospitals, that's post-secondary education, that's retail, um, that's parks and recreation, that's arts and culture. All of those kinds of things that you have to have have a livable community on a vibrant, sustainable basis. The underlying principle in all of this is that businesses cannot succeed in communities that fail. And your business is to make sure you have communities that don't fail, and you do it by attracting positive business. We're doing it. Our challenges are so much of it, right? The other side of, of infrastructure and community well-being is the social element. There's Everybody knows a lot about Fort McMurray, but very few people have ever visited there and spent much time there, in my experience. So we have a lot of myths going on about it. I want to give you some new myths, but they're not myths, the reality of Fort McMurray. And the social opportunity that we have here is Albertans and as Canadians, and something that's really, quite frankly, very intriguing to me. We just finished our census, and for the first time since 2006, the province actually accepted the numbers, okay? The province has been giving grants to the Wood Buffalo area based on 2006 populations and a 7.5% annual growth rate. So they've not been getting anywhere close to the kinds of grants they should on a per capita basis that they're entitled to because they haven't believed the census numbers because they're quite astounding. Uh, look at it, 7.5% compounded growth rate for the last 12 years. That's a big numbers. Those are hard numbers to handle. 
and there's huge challenges that happen with that, obviously, housing. But I'll get to that one in a minute, too. Let me tell you what I think is most fascinating. 76,000 people live in Fort McMurray, the urban service area, as we call it, more or less. But they use municipal water at the rate of 100 to 110,000 people. How does that happen? Either we're the cleanest, best hydrated, but most wasteful people on the planet, or there's really 110,000 people there because they, they're living in a fluid basis, they're living in basements, they're living, living illegally because they don't have, we don't have the housing accommodation that we need in the region. But if just presume the 76,000 people is a real number, here's the fascinating thing about that, over and above the water usage. They come from 127 different countries and they speak 69 different languages. Take that as a school challenge. Take that as a community cohesion challenge. Take that as an opportunity for inclusiveness. This is a petri dish to grow a 21st century globalized culture model for the rest of the planet if we do it right. And if we screw it up, it's going to be the largest dysfunctional truck stop on the planet. <laughs> right? We have no choice in that. We have to do it the first way. We have to do it planning, we have to do it collaboratively. We're all in this together. And you as owners have to be part of that as well. You have to start thinking in those kinds of terms. The other challenges you get with this is that land is very expensive. We don't have land release. Um, we, we have, a, we have a, an anomalous situation where there were, there were bitumen leases granted right up to the city boundaries a few years ago. With nobody thinking you're ever going to expand the city? Of course you're going to have to expand the city. But now we've got ourselves in a, in a relationship issue there, trying to resolve all those relationships to get land release so we can get housing prices be more reasonable. An average 1,400 square foot bungalow uh, front garage on a 40 foot lot, um, 750,000 bucks. Give or take, prices are coming down a bit. I think the last month was 736,000 around, give or take. That's are comparable with downtown Vancouver prices, but we don't have any $5 million penthouses that skews those numbers. That's just the average person going into those kinds of properties. It's hard to attract and retain people when you've got to do that. And CMHC will not allow 5% mortgages in that, in that area. You have to put 20% down. So that, having a vibrant, sustainable community with those kinds of situations, is, those are challenges for us. And those are the impacts of growth, and that's why we've got to work with the province and the municipality and the industry to help solve those problems together. We don't own any of these issues as oil sands, save and except two, camps and aerodromes. We own those issues and we create those issues. But everywhere else, we're part of the problem, we're also part of the solution, but we have to do it collaboratively. And it's, it's complex stuff because you're dealing with value trade-offs and all those kinds of things all the time. The other reality of uh, the infrastructure is schools. Um, we need 12 schools in Fort McMurray in the next eight years based on the population growth that we have there. We're not going to get them. We're not going to get them. So what else can we possibly do? Right? We have to find opportunities and changes and challenges there. The other fascinating statistic, you won't, you won't get told much about Fort McMurray, but it doesn't, shouldn't surprise you. There's, um, it's a young population. The mean age is 32. So there's a lot of babies born. 120 to 150 babies a month are born there. There's nine maternity beds. Okay, if we're going to encourage young families to come there, we need to fix that, and it's in the process of being fixed. There's another collaborative opportunity that we can work with other people and say, how do we work this together? The advantage is we're pretty good now at assessing what the needs are going to be because it's all driven by industry development projections. And we, we watch our projections pretty quickly and pretty carefully, but we're getting pretty good at knowing how that, you know, when you put another 100,000 barrels out, what does that mean in terms of schools and hospitals and parks and recreation, all those kinds of things? We've got that going. We're pretty good at it, which we have a real advantage of. The other fascinating thing about infrastructure downtown is, is in Fort McMurray specifically, and I'll get to the next region in a minute, is that they have, as a council, agreed that their goal will be to the most, to be the most sustainable northern city in the world. 
sustainable on a green basis. So here's the fascinating thing that they've done. And this is something you guys could all pick up and start using too, I expect. They've, they've actually acquired their dump. Their, the, the, the CAO said, yeah, you call it a landfill, but we all know it's a dump. He calls it a dump. They bought their dump from the province. 820 acres, something like that. And what they've done is they've put up a biodiesel unit and they're collecting all the cooking oil. There's a lot of comfort food in these camps. There's a lot of cooking oil in Fort McMurray. I'm living proof of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're collecting that cooking oil, and they're creating biodiesel out of that. These are, these are, it hasn't happened yet. The equipment's in place. They're putting it together. It'll be running this year. Of that biodiesel, they've got a gasification technology that runs at low temperature, 450 degrees Celsius, OK? And they're using, the minute, they got permission to go 10 tons a day of solid waste. There's only one tenth of what they're actually creating. So this is, this is a demonstration project. That gasification unit will generate enough electricity to power 1,100 homes just using their solid waste. They have curbside recycling in Fort McMurray that you don't have to separate anything for. They separate glass and, and paper out, primarily cardboard out, but everything else they gasify and turn, and turn into electricity. That's really cool. And this thing comes in a container. Okay? They can put it up there and put it in a container. The industry is really fascinated about this because we have 40 years with the landfill in Suncor and 35 years with the landfill at Syncru. And everybody else has it as well as we're growing. We could be doing that same, that same thing. We do big cogeneration now. 26% of the power in Alberta is generated out of, out of oil sense development with natural gas. Can you imagine what our footprint would be if we use coal like everybody else does, right? So they, they take this gasification process, and here's the really cool part about sustainability. That's sustainable in itself. But the really cool part of it is when you take this gasification unit, you get these byproducts. One is ash, which we need for concrete, we use that. The other is heat, the other is methane, and the other is CO2. We capture the methane, we capture the CO2, we capture the heat, and we're putting up greenhouses. We're doing local food in Fort McMurray. Aquaponics, fish and vegetables. If you, if you live in Fort Chip, which is the farthest north, first, first European settlement in the province, a tomato costs nine bucks on a good day. It has an 85 gram carbon footprint coming out of California. We'll be able to grow that tomato with a 0.5 gram carbon footprint in that area and for a lot less than nine bucks and fresh with the, with the business opportunity being developed there at the same time. That's an opportunity we can integrate into the oil sands because we generate a lot of CO2, we generate a lot of heat, and we can gasify our waste the same way. We're, we're going to start looking at how we model that in other ways. The other situation is with water. And sustainability, where we're starting to cooperate, collaborate with industry and, and the municipality. They're building a new wastewater treatment plant in one of the communities, and there's a SAG operator around there. What's being worked on right now is the municipal water will be taken, used, shipped for municipal purposes, treated to gray water standards, shipped by a small pipeline to a, to a SAG D plant, boiled up, put into the ground to generate to generate the uh, the oil, the water comes up hot enough that we'll ship it back to the municipality. They'll use it for district heating purposes, for buildings on a basis, take the heat out of it. Then they'll use it for municipal purposes again, treat it and send it back to us. We'll have a closed loop system on water with industry and municipality working at the same time. Very cool. <laughs> and this is driven by the municipality not by the industry. They're the ones that are coming up with these ideas, and we're starting to adapt to them. More collaboration opportunities that go that way. So, I'm conscious of my time. Uh, the other area that, I, that I'd like to talk to you about is how we impact the rest of the province and how we can work more collaboratively together on a broader base. We're gonna have a, we have a skill shortage. When we, I talked about the living out allowance and how it raised rents. When we want tradespeople, we want people, we take them all over, the, all over the province, all over the planet right now. 
because it looks like you're going to be going to, and we impact your capacity, don't we? We impact your capacity negatively. We also have a lot of your people, uh, your, your coming into Fort McMurray on a fly in, fly out basis, and that impacts your communities as well. We get to start looking and thinking about those things too. We're now looking at getting a look, doing a process for sustainable community indicators. If we're going to do socioeconomic impacts, what's our baseline? Where are we today and what's important? So we're looking at not just GDP, we're looking at genuine progress indicators and even happiness indicators. Uh, there's a lot of research that's been done on this and I think it applies very nicely and easily in the, into this region. And there's various levels that we can do this at. So one of the things we did a number of years ago was we looked at sustainable community indicators as industry. We started the project and then and we ran it three different times we're going to do it in a, in a more comprehensive basis this time, I think, which would be run by industry, collaborating with other communities, and eventually be taken over by those communities. But we need to know if we're going to be participating in a collaborative way on impacts on socioeconomic, how do we know we're making a difference? How do we know we're moving the needle on a positive basis? We're looking at baseline to do that. That will be a large-scale, full-blown, world world-class and world-scale collaboration that people will, will notice and look at. You'll have access to that. It'll be public documentation. You can see it, use it, maybe adapt it to your own purposes. There are some places, Edmonton's done it, uh, NISCU, Leduc has done it, uh, Beaumont is doing it right now, as I understand. Um, but it's the idea of looking at genuine progress indicators. Uh, is it, I'm gonna paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact side of it, but. Bobby Kennedy um, talked about this many, many years ago, and he said, GDP is a very good indicator for some things, but we use it for the wrong purposes. It's very insufficient for what we really need to do as community. He said, for example, a fellow works late, goes to the bar, drinks too much with his buddies, um, gets in his car, runs into a telephone pole, breaks the pole, cuts the power off in the region as a result of that, drives away uh, from the accident, uh, it, it confronts his wife, there's a domestic incident where the police come, the children are apprehended, and that's, every one of those things contributed positively to GDP. Okay. <laughs> now, that same guy walked home, read to his kids, made love to his partner, went in the garden and pulled out some carrots and, and, and cooked a meal and, and, and spent some time with, in the neighborhood with friends at a, at a sports event, didn't contribute anything to GDP. Okay, what's the better life? What's the better life? And so what we're looking at, not either or, it's yes and. But how do we take a look at these opportunities and create that kind of an option, that situation? As owners of this resource, Things are being done in our names. They're being done by industry, they're being done by governments at all levels, and by organizations and community organizations around, and by the economy. As a result of that ownership, we should be looking at social license to operate in a much more significant basis. And what's really motivating this is the social license to operate. Industry has come to the realization, I think, at the, at the highest levels, that this is a time to make that difference. It used to be in the old days that if you got a lease and a permit, that was social license because the government granted that and if you had it, that was sufficient for your social license. Then the environmental issues came along and so if you get ERCB approval, you get environmental approval and you perform appropriately, you behave appropriately, that should be enough to have a grant of social license. It's not. Those are just antis into the game. What's been realized is that governments and government agencies grant permits. It's the public that grants social license. And the public do it, does that on a value set. We did some more research on, and, and this is Cambridge research, but it's relevant to all of you and as, as owners of the resource and me as a spokesman from an industry point of view. How are we going to be measured and how should we be measured on our social license? And there's some politicians in the room here I know too. Your social license is called consent to govern. 
You have to, you, it's the same thing, just in a different theme. Consent to govern means do you have permission to do things on behalf of the public interest, and is it truly in the public interest to make these, quote, hard choices, which hard choices are just political code for value trade-offs, right? And you have to make those value trade-offs, and you do it against certain values. Here are the values that Albertans want to be used when a politician, an industry leader, uh, or a decision maker, or a policy maker of any kind is evaluating a decision that impacts my life. First and foremost, with a bullet, is integrity. I'll get back to that. Second is transparency. Third is honesty. Fourth is accountability. Fifth is environmental stewardship. Personal responsibility and fiscal responsibility are right after those. But let's just work on integrity for a few minutes. This is, I think, the key word that will be coming forward soon when you talk about social rights to operate and consent to govern. Integrity is a very easy word to say, a hard word to define, because it depends on the circumstances and the context in so many ways. Right? It's like cruelty. I don't know how to, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. Right? It's that same thing. I use it in this way. If integrity is all things considered, consider all things. Pretty easy, simple, slogan way of doing it. It's not easy to do, it's hard to do. But your actions are consistent with your values. You're, you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. Okay, that's one element of integrity. And you can be trusted, okay? What we have, historically, in the competitive market model, and I'm a capitalist, I love the market model, it's been very, very good to me. But it's not, it's not the end all and be all for every, for every question we face as a society and as communities. You have this, you know, this conflict between trust and turf. And if you have a loose situation between people, uh, you get lots of trust. If people can trust each other, they expect that what you say you're going to do, what you say you're going to do, what you say you can do, and then I don't have to lock my house and I'm going away for the holidays where you take care of my place and here's the key to the place. That's a loose relationship with your neighbor with high degree of trust. If you don't have that, then you've got a gated community and security and watchdogs, and you got you know got, you got somebody private private uh, investigators, private police coming on on a regular basis. So it's that 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 situation between trust and turf. The higher the turf, the lower the trust. The higher the trust, the lower the turf. Right. The other side of integrity is integrated, and this is where all this is starting to come down from an industry point of view. Triple bottom line, we all know what that is, right? The social element in the triple bottom line is now starting to get paid attention to on a timely and a comprehensive basis. So the business model is there, the environmental responsibility stewardship is coming on and, and will be there, and now is it, what are we leaving behind as a legacy, right? How are we doing this that is creating genuine wealth? that is contributing back to communities in a positive way to other generations. There's an environmental element there, but there's many other elements in that, in that situation too. So the social element of that triple bottom line is all coming to be integrated. I'll go back to those four buckets that we look at, in workforce, Aboriginal relations, infrastructure, community well-being. They're all, inter they're all interrelated. Take any issue and you start the conversation someplace, you're going to pull them into the other areas. We, got a, we have a skilled workforce problem, okay? We have a 40% wipeout rate in the first two years of apprentices. Why is that? Okay, We can't afford that. We need those people. We don't need the personal tragedy of not being successful in these situations, too. And how many of those are Aboriginal? We get into the Aboriginal. As an infrastructure need, I need those people to build all that infrastructure. We need it for the industry to grow and, and be there. We also have a well-being. We need a skilled, educated workforce that is productive and that can raise families and live here and, and live to that situation where we say we have a good place to live, work, invest, and raise a family, right, and play. All those things tie to each other really, really dramatically, and this integrated thing is part of that. And then, the last part of, of integrity, is it integral? Is it relevant? Is it the stuff we should be paying attention to? Okay. When we, when we don't do that on a collaborative basis, we get more of the tragedy the commons. Our self-interest, our, our market models make sense, but unless we look at what the impact is, the ripple effect on other people, we can do great harm with that. So 
This is not an argument against capitalism. This is not an argument against growth and economic development. What it is is an argument for saying you are in a larger context than just business, right? Businesses can't succeed and communities can fail, and communities can't succeed without business. And that's the interdependent relationship that we have here that is all part of this socioeconomic impact that is being looked at now in the oil sands. I think you guys are looking at it the same way. We're looking at a macro basis in a number of communities. We all, at the same time, it used to be only about the RMWB, now it's about the Athabasca oil sands. So I'm in Lac La Biche, I'm in Cold Lake, I'm in Athabasca, which is on the edge of it, but I'm also going to have to be in Elk Point, right? I'm going to have to be in Lamont because as we move those modules, we're coming up through those areas, and I'm going to be in Wabascott and Emory. Now, all those communities are very different from each other, but they all share one thing in common, and that's the impact of the oil industry. And I can look around this room and I say, I don't have to, I don't have to stretch very far to say, I bet you we impact everybody in this room in one way or another. And how do we do that? It's an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing resource. It's a Canadian resource. It's in terms of its benefit. It is a long-term resource, but it's non-renewable. Here's the other thing. My closing comments are this. The long-term benefit coming out of oil sands will be technologies about excavation and mining and all those kinds of things. It'll be learning how to do socioeconomic impacts on a comprehensive, collaborative way. It will be learning how to do high-level, independent, third-party, reliable science on the environment and how to adjust your behaviors accordingly. So here's the deal. I think that the long-term benefit coming into the oil sands is going to be reclamation technologies going forward. We have to reclaim everything that we put in. We're not going to put it back exactly the way it was. We can't. But we've been, we, we have an obligation. We've proven we can now put it in to a self-sustaining, biodiverse environment. Um, there's a, there's a, um, a relief by an artist in the, in the Rutherford Library at the U of A in the, in the in the foyer of the Robert Rutherford Library. And it is uh, the Suncor Reclamation site by the Wap uh, Wapasu. It's, their, it's the, the reclamation of their, of their tailing pond. And it's, um, it's a relief. And you see Premier Stelmax there, and Rick George is there, and, and then all these kind of politicians. And you see in the back up, the, it's kind of in time frame. It's the way they started from the back of the relief to where they are at the present day. And I said to the artist, who's this on the corner? It's a woman kneeling down with her hand up. And she says, oh, that's a, that's a biologist and technologist. And I said, what's she got? And she says, that's a mushroom. Said, that's the first mushroom that grew by itself that wasn't planted. That was the first indication this was going to work and sustain itself on the, on, the, on the floor basis. And I said, that's the name of your release, the first mushroom. And that's what she calls it now. But this, when you look at natural disasters, wars that are going on, and you look at all the industrial sites around the world that are going to have to be reclaimed eventually. That will be the efforts in that. We'll know how to do it. We'll have proven how to do it. It will be for the planet. And it'll come out of oil sands. Because those are the technologies and the environment. That'll be the ultimate integrity for us, coming out of this, coming out of this technology, coming out of this resource, in my mind. So look at ourselves, our burdens. We're the best educated most literate, best paid, healthiest, youngest, most urban, most cosmopolitan people in this country. And we aspire to be the best in the world in a number of things. First class in this, best place in the world to live, work, play, invest, and raise a family. With all those blessings and all the infrastructure we have and the assets of this resource, and the potential environmentally and socially as well as investment and on an international basis. And that, and that diversity that we're drawing here with those people that are coming to work and take advantage of these opportunities from all over the planet, we should not be aspiring to be the best in the world. We should be aspiring to be the best for the world with this asset. As I've heard, I encourage you to take that attitude, keep our feet to the fire, get yourself more knowledgeable and experienced about it. Start looking at your own energy literacy. Start thinking about reducing your own footprint and taking the attitudes that you see that the municipality of Wood Buffalo and how we become more sustainable as communities, 
how we can help you as industry and how government can help you by encouraging all of this. We're all in it together alone. Thank you very much. I'm open to talk.